as Ken Michaels would say, hello, hello, and welcome to Things We Said Today. This is a Beatles video podcast um, program where we talk about anything and everything having to do with the Beatles, together, apart, uh, things related to the Beatles, things related to anything having to do with the four Beatles individually. Uh, it's a bi-weekly show. My name is Darren DeVivo. I'm from WFUV Radio in New York City. Um, one of the DJs there, and have been at WFUV on the air for 40 years. And I want to welcome everyone on board to what's going to be a very special show. Uh, but first, I want to introduce you to my colleagues. Um, I don't know how he accomplishes all that he does. He hosts a syndicated radio show called Every Little Thing. He co-hosts another podcast called Talk More Talk which is all about the solo Beatles, the four individual Beatles. And he has a YouTube channel, which he uh, manages and fills with great interviews. Uh, it seems like every day I'm going online and there's something new on Ken Michaels radio, which you can access on YouTube. He's been, he's been spinning tunes on the radio actually for longer than me. Ken Michaels. How are you, Ken? I'm doing fine. And this is going to be, you know, a very momentous occasion with this special guest that we have in store for everybody. You asked me, how do I do it? As John Belushi once said, donuts. <laughs> now, speaking of momentous occasions, anytime I get to spend time with uh, my other host, it's a momentous occasion. Uh, right now, his world is Paul McCartney, uh, the co-author of the McCartney Legacy Volume 1. Coming soon, the McCartney Legacy Volume 2. And then he's got to start working on three. And then we got four. He uh, worked for the uh, New York Times for uh, decades, uh, writing pop music uh, articles. And he was a classical director at the New York Times, classical music director. Uh, he's written numerous books on the Beatles. And, well, now it's the McCartney Legacy. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Alan Cozen. Hello, Darren. Hello, Ken. I was really just a classical music critic at the Times, but I was also their Beatles desk for right, right. about 25 years. So um, that was fun. That you know broke things up a bit. <laughs> uh, and uh, so we get together, we do this thing, things we said today, it wouldn't work unless you were out there watching and or listening. And we have do have a very special show and a very, very special guest. But first, uh, Ken's got a few news items for us. Ken? Well, since we just had a new show a few days ago, um, the news is kind of brief this time, but this is what's transpired in those few days. Paul McCartney has allowed his UK hit song, We All Stand Together, to be used in a promotional film for the International Paralympic Committee. The song originally was used in the animated short of Rupert the Bear, and it was a top three smash hit in the UK in 1984 with George Martin producing the record. This is being used to start its 100-day race, which happened starting May the 20th, to the opening ceremony in Paris, which will happen in August. IPC President Andrew Parsons told the Associated Press, Sir Paul really understands what we stand for as a movement, and he was so generous to us. He was not difficult to convince. It was something that came very naturally. Well, for Badfinger fans, this has been a banner year with the release of Pete Ham demos called Gwent Gardens back in March. On my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, I interviewed Tom Brennan, who helped to compile and produce that release, which came out digitally and on CD. And the release has done so well that it's now in its third pressing. And... Now we have another compilation of demos, this time from Tom Evans from Badfinger. It's called I Am Myself, and it's due out June 5th on what would have been Tom's 77th birthday from the same record company, Y&T Records, which stands for Yesterday and Today. This will contain 21 original unadorned demo recordings approved by the Evans Estate and is a one-time pressing of a thousand copies that comes in a beautiful digipack and art print with a rare early photo of Tom. It is now available for pre-order at Amazon and most online stores. It'll, it'll be available on all streaming platforms. Uh, guitarist and songwriter Martin Sexton is going on tour September 5th through October 30th for what is billed as his Abbey Road Show. 
It will do two sets. The first is performing songs from the Abbey Road album in what is described on his Facebook page in a compelling uh, and reimagined way. That's how he describes his interpretations of the songs from Abbey Road. The second set is his original songs. For more information, you can visit his website at martinsexton.com. Thanks to Steve Downing for that information. We also have to report on the death of Frank Ifield. British-born Australian singer who had quite a lot of success first in Australia and then when moving back to England. He scored three number one hits in a row in the UK, the only artist other than Elvis Presley to achieve that feat at that time. The first of those songs was I Remember You, which the Beals performed as part of their live performances, uh, one of which you can find on their album Live at the Star Club. It was also a number five hit in the U.S., a cover of a Johnny Mercer song, which he sang in a yodeling style. Uh, Frank was impressed with the Beatles single of Love Me Do, and he recognized the harmonica being used in the style of Bruce Chanel's Hey Baby. Frank himself was influenced by Chanel's record, and Frank's song also used the harmonica. He has more Beatle connections than that. Uh, on December 2nd, 1962, the Beatles opened for Frank at the Embassy Cinema in Peterborough. And in 1964, VJ Records, who had distribution rights to both the Beatles and Frank Ifield in the U.S., released an album called Jolly Watt, Frank Ifield and the Beatles on Stage. And this was one of many opportunities VJ made to exploit their one album's worth of material from the Beatles, combining eight Frank Ifield songs and four from the Beatles. Those four songs released as singles from the Fabs. And Frank and Paul McCartney apparently shared something else in common. They both dated the same girl at the same time. Caldwell. That's oh, that Iris, Iris Caldwell. And um, that was Rory Storm's sister, Iris Caldwell. Frank died on May the 18th in the Sydney suburb of Dural. He was 86. Just want to remind everybody, uh, some releases here just happened last Friday, May 17th. A good friend of ours, a colleague of ours, Jeff Slate, who you've seen perform at the Fest for Beatle Fans, just released his brand new CD, The Last Day of Summer. There's a brand new Beach Boys documentary, which will start airing on Disney Plus this Friday, May 24th. Just called the Beach Boys, and Paul McCartney is involved with that. He is interviewed in that documentary. So your chance on Disney Plus to watch the Beach Boys, let it be, and get back. Make it a whole weekend <laughs> with all three of those uh, great documentaries. And Ringo Starr's Crooked Boy EP and CD comes out officially May the 31st. And that's it. Short newscast this time. Very happy about that Tom Evans uh, album of demos coming. Yeah, and the, the Pete Ham demos are sensational. Mm, yep. uh, I can't imagine any Badfinger fan not loving it. It's just Pete playing all the instruments. Except one song, he actually has Ron Griffiths, the, the original bass player, mm, on uh, right. playing bass on one of the songs. Thank you, Ken. Uh, and now it's time uh, for our very, very very special guest um you all know who it is because you've probably read the description of the show uh but if you don't know how to read you're going to enjoy our guest coming up next it is such a privilege and such an honor to have an incredible talent with us here on things we said today the man who is the director of let it be but he's done so much more that we could do another show just running down the accomplishments of Michael Lindsay Hogg, filmmaker, author, playwright, painter, artist. Uh, am I leaving anything out, Michael? Uh, great, great thinker. Great thinker. Uh, and it is so incredible to have you here on the show today. Thank you for taking a few minutes out. I know it has gotten become very busy for you. Uh, over the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, why? <laughs> well, <laughs> I need cough now. It's be gotten very busy over the <clears throat> last few weeks because of something that I have been fighting for, and sometimes just being the, the lonely voice in the crowd, 
but I've been joined by some wonderful allies lately, which is getting Let It Be out again after being locked away for 50 years. Mm -hmm. Now, be before, I, I mean, let's set the stage. That's always, as I like to say on my radio show, it's always great to start at the beginning. Um, you had worked with the Beatles already and you'd worked with the Rolling Stones. Uh, it was the beginnings of a very long relationship, in fact, with the Rolling Stones. And you did, they weren't called videos, but promo films for the Beatles Stones. I believe the Who as well. Right. That you uh, were the director of Ready, Steady, Go. Uh, the, 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 the television series as well. So with the Beatles doing Hey Jude and Revolution as, you know, a video, a, a promo clip, and you were there as the director of that, tell us how that was the seed that was planted that became Let It Be. Yeah, that's an interesting question, Darren, because it, it, it was the seed. Um, as, as you guys know, the Beatles stopped touring in 1966 because it had gotten too crazy for them, and they really were kind of finished with that part of their lives. <clears throat> uh, when Paul and I got uh, into discussion about how to do the Hey Jude video, uh, I, I said to him that there was an ingredient we needed to introduce into the visual things, which was an audience, uh, a crowd, people, because it couldn't just be on them for the chorus, because it, it goes on for four minutes, and no matter how great they are, were and are, I'd run out of shots. So we discussed the chorus and we thought what it should be like. And then we thought, well, it shouldn't just be the kids from the fan club. It should be a cross section of people in England at the time, housewives, uh, working kids, the village postman, and more importantly, brown and black citizens, because England had changed so much into the 1960s from when, for example, the Beatles had grown up in Liverpool during the Second World War. And uh, so that's the way we we wanted to choose the people to be present. OK, so we do six takes of Hey Jude. And after each take, we have to reload the video reel because we get a fresh reel for each Beatles take. So there's no disturbance on the tape and we know it's a good reel that takes 10 or 12 minutes. So in the first break, the Beatles sit in the rostrum and have a smoke and just chat. And that's what the audience does, too. They're, they're, they're separate. But then um, in the second break, 10 or 12 minutes, uh, the equation that the Beatles had learned um, as teenagers uh, came into their heads, which is um, band plus audience equals play. And so they started to play and they started to play not their own songs. I don't really remember that so much, but they started playing uh, Smokey Robinson. They started playing Little Richard. They started playing the Everly Brothers. And they did this for the next five breaks. And so the audience was thrilled. I mean, they're getting a free Beatles concert, which runs for 50 minutes. The Beatles were thrilled at being so proximate with an audience, which was having such a good time and wasn't you know throwing themselves off the third floor of the stadium or anything like that and that's the way the evening ended and of course then the video for hey jude uh was quite successful um a lot of people liked it a lot of people liked the audience uh the mixture of the beatles plus the audience <coughs> and it's helped them sell some records um then about um so this is the answer to your question about a month later or so, I get a call from Paul McCartney asking me to come up and see him. Come up is not a long way. I was working with the Rolling Stones. They were five, they were five minutes away from the Beatles' office. Come up and, and, and see me sometime. So I walked over and went up into the conference room, which was a walkthrough room with a lot of things there. And over by a window, <clears throat> sitting, um, you know, uh, having tea, was Paul and John. Um, John was smoking and uh, not marijuana tobacco and so we i sat down do you want some tea no thanks and then paul said you know we've been thinking that we kind of enjoyed playing to the audience on the hey jude video and we didn't think we wanted to be anywhere near an audience again it had just gotten too crazy for us but then that led us to think that 
maybe somehow, maybe not sure, but maybe we could do a concert again. And if we did do a concert again somewhere, would you want to do it with us? And so <clears throat> I said, sure. And that's how we then, and as you know, it wasn't a concert because that fell apart after about 10 days at Twickenham. But then it became a, a movie. And be, but because of the idea was a concert, that sort of goes back to uh, Hey Jude. I don't think that they wanted to do anything at the beginning without it being concert because they'd done their own magical mystery tour a year or so before. And so they'd done they'd worked that out of their systems. And um, so that's why I always say that, that Hey Jude is the father to 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 let it be and let it be in the same way as the father to get back. What was their um their reaction to the suggestion when they were about to do the Hey Jude promo film about having people in the studio? Because if there was some hesitancy about performing in front of people, um it it um I'm sure probably if there was any any resistance, it would have turned up then before uh, they started uh, filming uh, Hey Jude. Was there any hesitance? No. 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 Once Paul and I talked it through, um, he was the main person in the same way that with the Rolling Stones, Mick was the one to talk the idea first. Year. Not that the others weren't interested, not they weren't involved, but he was the he was the first gatekeeper, and so he saw what it that it could work the beatles plus a crowd especially the kind of crowd we 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 chose a mixed crowd ages sexes colors everything like that and so then he, he i would guess had uh, you know said to the to the other three here's here's what michael and i talked about because don't forget i knew them before from with the um, paperback writer and rain right and also right. i'd worked with john uh i was about to work with john in um no, I don't, already worked with him. It's about to work with him again in the Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus. So I think Paul discussed it with them and they all signed on and that's what happened. So the answer is not that I saw no resistance. And then um, how much time? It could only have been a matter of weeks before, okay, let's do this. And the ball starts rolling that will gather, what was it, January 2nd, I believe, 1969. Yeah. At Twickenham Film Studios. Yeah, well, in fact, the ball was rolling at the same time uh, with the Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus because I was prepping that. Well, I had to come up with the idea, which took a, a while. So we were trying to, I was trying to do that with the Rolling Stones while going over every week or 10 days to Apple and talking to the, the four Beatles about what we were going to do. And so it was, it was a pretty crowded time and um and as i say john was on the rock and roll circus and and that's the other thing to remember just as a as a side remark is they were rivals the the, the beatles the rolling stones and the who for, and the kings sort of yardbirds but they all were friends they'd come up at the same time at the same age kids from world war ii and so there was a i mean the, in the rock and roll circus there's a a very sweet little interview that Mick and John do together. So we started in Twickenham with no fixed idea on January the 2nd, 1969. Um, but we figured out, we'd, we'd figure out the idea when we were all together. And we had, there were various ideas thrown around, uh, do it in the field. Uh, uh, Ringo thought, well, <clears throat> maybe do it in the cavern, which is where they'd begun. And then I said, yes, and, and the cavern and the Beatles were linked forever. But since now the audience that might be wanting to watch a Beatles concert television special, we're more than just the citizens of Liverpool, but we're talking millions of people now that maybe we ought to shoot for a bigger kind of venue. <laughs> and I'd um, heard of this amphitheater on the coast of, of Libya and 2,000 years old, the Mediterranean sparkling, you know, at night. And I had an idea that, that we should all go to Libya. Now, this sounds it's very highfalutin, but in those days, there was a sense that if the Beatles wanted to do something, they just had to press a variety of buttons and it would get done. 
Um, so I, I was trying to say, because I was trying to say, I just envision the dawn coming up and, and Mal and, and Kevin laying out the instruments and then the Beatles coming and starting to tune up and, and play a song, maybe not even play a Beatles song, maybe, maybe uh, playing You Really Got a Hold on Me. And then the music would start to go out across the desert it was a kind of melting pot part of the world. Um, there's an American service uh, base nearby. There were black citizens, brown citizens, Africans, uh, Arabs, children, whatever. And that gradually the music would beckon the people across to the amphitheater. And so by nighttime, when Let It Be was being played, the, the amphitheater would be full of the world. Now, that uh, that struck a chord with them because they they were always wishing to be connected to as large an audience and as many different people as possible and so that struck a chord with them and they sort of thought yeah maybe and then we were going to hire a boat and maybe we're going to bring some of the english audience on the boat and rehearse on the boat and it got more and more elaborate and and um, if, in my view, it was it could have been an extraordinary um, event. Anyway, um, George, <laughs> the end of the cold. George was starting to be resistant to the idea of a concert, whether it was big or small. That he really wanted to uh, work on the songs, uh, and he also really wanted to have some. Um, some of his own songs. Um, and so then, as we all know, he left, he, you know, went on a walking tour, he went to stay with his family in Liverpool. And we, we all sat around for a day, which is very well <clears throat> elaborated in, in Peter's Get Back. And then he said, yeah, I'll come back, but I, I, Twickenham is not a good place to make music, even though that's where we shot Hey Jude. And, um, I, I want to go to Apple. I want to work. And I don't want any concert. So what had begun as a concert film, uh, which then is what links back to Hey Jude, um, then became a documentary kind of overnight. And they're very different things to plan. Uh, if, you, if you're trying to do a concert in an amphitheater in Libya, you're thinking, where do I put the generators? Where does the... Where does the craft services go? Where, where do you put the bathrooms? A million things like that. And um, so then a documentary is a different thing. It's a documentary. Well, I realized I was in a very privileged position because no one had ever really filmed the Beatles rehearsing before. There'd been little clips of it. Um, but there hadn't been, they hadn't allowed access to them working on songs together, having moments of frustration, uh, having moments of getting it together. Um, and so I felt that as a responsibility, not, not only to our own project, but also to the future for people who want to see how, how they work. Um, because we we're, were talking about four exceptional musicians who changed the world. Um, but I also was realizing that um, a, a documentary of just them rehearsing um, while fascinating it needed um, somewhere it was going. Otherwise, it just might be, um, you know, the, the 85th rehearsal of Get Back or something like that, which would be great. But I wanted to find a conclusion. And that's why um, And <laughs> at lunch, at lunch one day on a Saturday, I said, well, we didn't... Um, go to Libya to the amphitheater. So why don't we just go up on the roof? And then and then Paul said, and what do we do on the roof? And I said, well, maybe a concert. And, and then four days later or five days later, we, we were on the roof doing, as we all know, if not the most famous, but one of the most famous concerts in rock and roll history, uh, which we didn't know at the time, it'd be the, the final performance of the Beatles. Mm. So, so that's 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 the link, Darren, between Hey right. Jude, the whole thing. Right, Ken. Let's um, let's hear from Ken Michaels now. Okay, Michael. Thanks for for being here for this. This is quite an honor. Um, I'd like to know how did everything manifest into it being rehearsing. I know they did a lot of rock and roll oldies and some of their older material, but the actual performance had to be all 
new songs. They yeah. Just as easily have done songs on the White Album, which had just come out a couple of months before. They could have done Hey Jude just like they did the Twickenham. We right. did the video in Revolution. Why did it have to be new material, all new material? Well, I, I think that's because once when George came back, um, <clears throat> they'd also early on had this wild idea, which was e even more impossible than going to the amphitheater in Libya, <clears throat> is that they would work, they would work, create a, a number of songs in the time we were together, new songs, because um, Ringo had a movie to go and do, and he had to do that in February. So they basically only had the month of January. And so they were <clears throat> starting to work on new songs. But one of the interesting things about that time in their lives is it was more they were original songs as much as collaborative songs, because the songwriters weren't living together the way they had been like when John and Paul were teenagers in Liverpool and they used to sit in Paul's bedroom and knock out Love Me Do or Please Please Me or something like that. <clears throat> they were sort of working on their own. I mean, because um, Paul's songs were different from, from John's songs. And then there were George's songs, which Paul and John um, perhaps were not paying as much attention to as they should because George had always been the younger, he'd always been the kid. And and George knew he was a songwriter. I mean, even the, the, some of the songs that came out of In Let It Be are very, they're more than promising, they're good. And then we know what happened to George as a songwriter after that. But they wanted to, this impossible Olympi Olympic-like task of writing all the songs in a month and being able to record them. Uh, so they had to be fairly simple, i.e. not a lot of strings or anything like that. And that's you know, and they needed a keyboard player, in came Billy Preston. So that was part of the brief they gave themselves. And one of the lucky things up on the roof was that when the police came up, uh, they'd run out of songs. <laughs> and I mean, th then they could have done You Really Got a Hold on Me, but they were sticking to their own songs. So that was an added complication to the entire month. I mean, fortunately, we all were very we all were young and we all had quick brains and we could assess information quickly and change our minds and, and move on um sometimes sadly but always you know keep keep the caravan rolling right uh, in fact we talked here on this show about when the cops stopped the concert they didn't have other material that they were ready for even though in let it be they did a great performance of for you blue which I felt right. possibly they could have done, but maybe it wasn't hard rocking enough <laughs> on, on top of the rooftop for people to, to really hear them. Did they ever talk with you about how long the show would go anyway, even if the cops didn't stop it? No, I mean, I think, well, one thing, it was very cold up there hmm. and it was like 42 degrees. And right, you know, when we were talking about going up on the roof in a little room beneath the roof, um, when it's still a little bit iffy, I mean, there are 11 cameras up there ready for them and it's still a little bit iffy. Hmm. Ringo said, quite rightly, he said it's very cold up there. He wasn't thinking about his drumsticks. He's thinking about the guitar player's fingers. Right. And so I think they had in their mind the brief of what songs they do. And, and I think they wanted them to be like the one after 909, they they wanted them to be rock and roll songs. And one of the things which is so exciting to me and, and, and really moving after all the time that's gone by, if I look at the roof again, like when we all saw it in New York at, on uh, the screening, um, was how excited they are, how communicative they are, how comradely they are playing together in what no one knew was the final performance. The, they had a wonderful time up there. I mean, even when we went down, we got off the roof and we went down and had a cup of tea in the in the control room and they were listening to some of the stuff with Glenn. They were buzzed. They were really high. And and they felt they felt really connected again. That's part of the beauty of the roof. We didn't know that was going to be the the plus plus cheesecake on the roof, but that's what happened. 
Yeah, in fact, that's one of the great moments in Get Back, seeing the yeah. Beatles after the rooftop yeah. concert. They looked exhilarated. Exactly, exactly, Ken, they did. Um, one, one important thing I want to ask you is that because we've heard so much about these sessions through the years, and as you know, and you've tried to defend Let It Be uh, by saying that it wasn't this, you know, miserable terrible, time terrible, that the Beatles terrible. had, yeah. you observed everything for that whole month, which is yeah. different from the rest of us, even with having almost eight hours of get back. Yeah. Was it more joyous or was it, was there a lot of misery during that time? Oh, no. How would you balance it, it, the two? It was, it was fun. I mean, after all, they, they are the Beatles and I don't mean they're, they're gods. What I mean is they're, they're talented and been through experiences. As Ringo said, only the four of us will ever know what it was like. And they'd been through experiences which were like war to do with the fans and the craziness of what was going on at the time, but also exaltation, also being able to uh, get their music out into the world, change the world. I mean, if, I mean, we as Americans, more than anyone, know that, you know, President Kennedy was killed in November 63 and they go on Ed Sullivan in February 64 and everything changes. Mm. Everything changes. So w was there moments of frustration as musicians? Yes, probably. But there are in, in any art form, whether it's theater, whether it's movies, whether it's ballet, people are always trying to say, no, do it. No, it's better if you do it that way. I don't think it's good to do it that way. No, do it that way. And mm. That's normal standard stuff. And of course, I, who is not a musician, I just was there as much with my eyes open. I was fascinated by and and hoping we were getting good stuff so whatever form this thing took in the end and as we know it's taken several forms now in, in, including peter's epic and i mean that in the best sense i love get back is is that um we would end up with something which was um as close to being something beatles proud as you could be so it was good i mean and the, the only thing which frustrated me is is uh, I knew that George was before he left was sort of bubbling a little bit and and I um, thought maybe it, it was a, we used to have lunch together that he'd come up and say listen well I'm I'm going for a while which is what he did and I'd bug the flower pot and um, then when I played back the <clears throat> the tape after lunch um, all I could hear was the ambient laughter in the background, cutlery on the plates. And I thought, I, I know what they were talking about is great. And I didn't get it. And then, of course, Peter, who's um, not only a wonderful director, but really good at all the technical stuff, had figured out <coughs> how to split, how to split separate the audio. So you get the you get the the vocal and you get able to bury the uh, um, the ambient sound. And that's that great conversation in Get Back when, when Paul and John and it's, Oh, this is so great. This is a movie, and all he's shooting is a tablecloth and a flower pot. And you have one of the most interesting sequences in the entirety of Get Back, which is Paul and John talking to each other man to man. Right. It's a very revealing moment. Yeah, totally. Get back. Alan? Um, Michael, were you involved in the remastering of the film, or was that entirely Peter? That was entirely Peter because... Um, he has the equipment. Uh, he's got the studio um, wing nut. Is it called wing nut? Yeah. No. Yeah. Wing nut. And we were going to, Lisa and I were going to go over to New Zealand and we're looking forward to it. But the, the week we were going to travel, there was a cyclone. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't want to be, <clears throat> you know, 7, 18, 22 hours in the air and then run into a cyclone. Mm -hmm. um, so we did it also. The only things we talked to, talked to, A, I trusted Peter very much. And also he and I, right from the beginning, formed a, a very, what I would call, affectionate and respectful friendship. And um, he's been really important in, in the latter half of getting Let It Be Out. Um, but I knew his equipment was good. And he used to send me, he used to send me um, little clips of, look at this and look at that. In fact, the, when we met originally in um, December 9, 2018, um, he'd already started doing a little sort of reconstruction work. And he said, look at this, look at these two shots. 
One was from the original Let It Be, and it was a back shot of two of the Beatles, and their hair just looked like clumped hair. And then he said, now look at this shot, and you could see separate strands in their hair. So you knew that what he was doing over there to the negative was cleaning it up, making it vivid again because of what 50 years had done to it. So then the only thing we talked about was that uh, Tony Richmond, the DP, and I, since it had begun life as a film, just wanted to get a little more grain in Let It Be than than Peter had in Get Back, because Peter, Peter Get Back was very modern looking and very sort of digital looking modern. Uh, and he agreed. And so there is a little more grain, uh, but it still is very clean. And And one of the things I was keen on, because I knew that once Let It Be wasn't on the market anymore, mainly what people were watching were bootlegs, bootlegs which they'd taken off the VHS, which had come out and, and been withdrawn in 1974. And the bootlegs over time just got more and more degraded. The sound was degraded, the image was degraded. And so the thing I really wanted, and Peter wanted also, was to give the image, to give the negative new life again. And that's what he did. There are a couple of little structural things I wonder whether he ran past you uh, or, or whether you just thought differently of now. For instance, um, it, you seem to have conceived the film as like three acts. Act one mm. is is Twickenham, Apple, and then the rooftop. Yeah. And in the original, you had sort of like closing barn door dissolves in between each of those sections. And those are now gone. Now they just go from section to section. Is that something that you thought was just like no point in that anymore. Um, and, and also I, I the thought there's no point in that anymore. And in, in fact, didn't didn't help or hurt. But I thought hmm. maybe clean cut because it's very because it's very clear um, that the Twickenham ends with John and Yoko dancing. Right. And then the next thing is we're in London with the the cars, with the Rolls Royces and the Mercedes and stuff. And I figured that was enough of a. Uh, change of location for the audience to be on top of that and then the roof starts when paul comes up in the roof after mm. after the three ballads after uh, two of us and, and long and winding road and get back yeah so i was i was happy with that what about the ending the original ended with the sort of laughing coda of get back um, with John in a freeze and the new one goes to new credits with uh you know a, an outtake of Oh Darlin. Um, why couldn't the outtake of Oh Darlin and the new credits been after the laughing coda of Get Back? I I never, I always wanted the movie to end somehow with I Hope We Pass the Audition. And then it was either Paul or Neil Aspinall, the producer of it, who thought they wanted something oh, 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 mm. to be there at the end. Listen, it didn't bother me that it was there. The movie, as far as I was concerned, was over with the roof and John saying, I hope we pass the audition. And whatever happened after that, it, 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 pass the audition is the end of the movie for me. Okay. And so I, so I didn't mind if my, my, my betters and my producers wanted to add add what they added and um it didn't help the movie in its original release god knows nothing did <laughs> um okay and i have one more which is um when when uh you spoke to adrian uh sinclair for the mccartney legacy uh yeah. you talked about um you know in, in illustrating how paul's mind is so fertile you gave us the example of him proposing to you that maybe every fourth scene could be upside down and you made a cut with you know shortcut showing him how that would look and he realized that was like not the best idea yeah i actually remember he he wanted every sixth shot to be upside down and he said wouldn't it be kind of interesting now it could have been it just this every six shot or every fourth scene whatever uh we did it just to show him. I mean, in fact, it was it, it was slightly more arduous than the day of cutting film because, as you know, you've you've got you've got the film and then you cut it with a razor blade and then you've got to scotch tape it together and 
put it upside down as opposed to now like if you guys want to edit the, our conversation tonight you can just go pop 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 it's done but certainly out of respect and affection if paul says i want to see it upside down we would do it then he looked at it and as you say he said, no it doesn't work but you know fertile mind he has certainly that i'll tell you were there were there other things like that uh, that no um they'd come up and they'd look at um we moved the cutting room from Twickenham to uh, Savile Row and we got a room there and every so often they'd drop in, but they were also working on their other projects. Um, they drop in, you know, have a cup of tea, sit and chat, look at a bit of the cut, say, that's nice, that's interesting. Or maybe should there be another shot of uh, Ringo here doing that or George, you know, they, they, they were thinking, but they, they were more or less pleased with what they saw and then when we sh showed them the fine cut which i think was early november 1969 we all went out for um, a meal afterwards and then we went down there's the restaurant had a disco and you know everybody danced and had a nightcap and and their reaction uh, john and yoko had seen it the week before in a viewing theater and at least what they said to me was it's fine good okay you know and then the three of them when we had the dinner together uh everyone thought okay it's good it's fine it is what it is and we'll find out what it is when people see it how did you feel when john said shortly after the film that let it be was a uh, a film by paul for paul and he said that you know the camera was in entirely on paul um, were you hurt by those comments? And why do you suppose that the Beatles, for all these years that followed, had such a negative view of Let It Be, which is which could be different from the public because they lived it. They should have remembered what that month was like instead of just thinking that it was just the band breaking up. And they were far from breaking up at that point. Right. They were far from breaking up as, you know, I, I didn't include George leaving because it's, they, they didn't think when we started doing that they were going to break up. They were the Beatles hmm. and they might do side projects, but they were the Beatles was the entity. And um, so we started it with four Beatles. We finished it with four Beatles. We edited it with four Beatles. They showed it. We saw a rough cut. Four Beatles, four Beatles, four Beatles. But <clears throat> what had happened was Things interrupted the smooth flow of the let it be world that they began. Money was an issue for them that they were not. I think even when Brian was alive, they were not collecting the royalties. The royalties had not been negotiated properly. Uh, and I remember being at lunch with them one day when we were shooting and they were talking about they were using words like we're going broke. But in their terms, they were not getting in the revenue which they should have been expecting. And then what can happen is when they, this was all happening, probably I'd say December to early January, is legal um, wrangles can then become personal. And especially since in that particular case, uh, John had convinced the other two that Alan Klein would be someone to take over the business. And Paul very much wanted his brother-in-law, John Eastman, and father-in-law, Lee Eastman, who were very respected attorneys and people in the art world. They, were, they managed enormous estates, artist estates, like de Kooning and uh, Mark Rothko. If it wasn't those two, it was like that. And so there was a split, and then that split led to rancor. And so... Paul was the one, but just go back. It was Paul and John that I sat with in the early days when Paul said, we're thinking of doing a concert. And John could have nodded, you know, yeah, let's see what happens. Is that um, they, they didn't, they were happy enough when we were doing Let It Be. They were excited enough. They were frustrated enough. It was just a normal kind of artistic experience. Did, was Paul more of the leader? Yes, because Paul had a dream 
which is the Beatles would stay together and the Beatles would not only be a recording band, the Beatles would be a performing band because that's what he was used to. And he knew how great they were. We just all we have to do is look at the, the Ed Sullivan show, look at Shea Stadium. They, they were great. I mean, you have the, the Rolling Stones and they're making Keith age 80 and they're great, but they stayed together and uh, well, what's left of them stayed together. Um, but but Paul wanted wanted this to happen because I think he thought it was best for them. It wasn't best for him. He could listen, look what happened, look what's happened to Paul once the Beatles split. He had wings, his solo career goes through the roof. Uh I, I did Mall of Kintyre up in Scotland with Wings, and that's a great song. It's a great song. It's a McCartney song. There's no one else in that. So Paul has been fine, but he wanted something else. And they then, because of what was going on at the time, it was it was fractious. George wanted to have more attention paid. Ringo was working, going off in the movies. John had met Yoko, who was changing his life. And so they were all doing this a little bit, moving sideways. But um, in, at the time, for my money, Paul's ambition and his dream was a very solid and good one. Most definitely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank so you, you, Michael. And uh, it has been a pleasure chatting with you, but I want to give you a moment here at the end to tell <laughs> us what you're up to now and what's next for you now that the dust is beginning to settle on the uh, reemergence of Let It Be. What is happening in your life right now? I know that you have had uh, art exhibitions in recent years. Uh, tell us what uh, is next for Michael Lindsay Hahn. Well, Darren, I've got an art exhibition up here in Hudson, New York, with 80 paintings, um, some of which I'm glad to say are, have been sold. Um, and then there are two plays I'm working on to direct. One would be a, uh, a new mounting of a play I did a long time ago called Agnes of God with um, Geraldine Page and Amanda Plummer. They were in the original. And um, the place is just as interesting as it was 40 years ago. And then there's another new play um, that I'm working on, which may have a production in London before it has a production in America. <clears throat> so I am working. Um, I, I've never I've been working since I was 16 and I, I'm one of the I, I know I'm lucky that many people have had careers and jobs and livelihoods which did not provide them with particular happiness or satisfaction. I've had ups and downs, God knows, downs to do with not being able to get at work and not being able to get the kind of work I wanted. But I've always been glad to go to work in the morning. And that's lucky, I think. And, you know, I've made a living at it. Um, that's good, too. Uh, but it's basically painting and maybe working in the theater. I'd love to do maybe some more rock and roll. But again, just finishing off about lucky. As you mentioned at the beginning, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, and the Who, you can't get better than that. I did a video, one or two, with Elton. And um, and then I did the concerts, uh, Simon Garfunkel in New York, and, and the great one, which is Paul Simon's Graceland in Zimbabwe. Um, so I'm still working, and uh, my brain is working, more or less. <laughs> and I, I've, had a, I've had a good time with the three of you tonight. And... and um, I wish you all the best for me too. Thanks. Thank you so much for doing this, Michael. Thank you, Michael. I, and nice I see you all. And thank you for giving us your time. Appreciate oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Listen, Darren, we had such fun when we were doing that thing with Tilly and everybody that I think I have a little extra grace time for you. Oh, thank you so much. That's very kind of you. I thank I you, I Michael Lindsay Hogg, on things we said today. One word. Wow. I want to thank Michael Lindsay Hogg for taking some time out of a very busy schedule to chat with us. Um, Michael did make a reference to an interview I did with him. That was at the Fest for Beatles fans in 2022, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Get back was 2021, November 2021. Uh, and uh, so it was in March of 2022. I wasn't even I don't think I was aware that Michael had made himself available to be a guest via Zoom. 
uh, that weekend at the Fest for Beatles fans. But uh, I got the phone call. Well, hey, would you like to interview Michael Lindsay Hogg in a half an hour? I won't get into what I was doing at that time, but I got the phone call. But um, and uh, it was a it was a pleasure chatting with him and having him here with us for a few minutes. And hopefully our paths will cross again. Uh, and um, hope you enjoyed the conversation. Um, so as we put a wrap on another edition of Things We Said Today, let's go around the horn and uh, pass along some vital information about each one of us. Ken? Okay, first of all, on my uh, YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, I just did an interview with Daryl Easley. He is the editor for Record Collector. And back in January, they put out this issue uh, devoted exclusively to Paul McCartney and his solo career. Covers all of Paul's albums, uh, the Fireman records, his classical records, has uh, some contributions from Mike McCartney and Mickey Dolan's in there. Um, it's very thorough. It's It really is appealing to a hardcore McCartney fan and even just uh, a casual McCartney fan. You can learn so much in this uh, issue that came out in January, which you can still pick up online. And uh, we talked about Paul's solo career and some of the information offered in this issue and some of the reviews of Paul's albums. Goes from McCartney through McCartney 3 in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. On Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, we just did a show uh, with Ken Womack as our special guest in which we talked about the Let It Be film and gave our thoughts about it and what we think about the new restoration and whatnot. And you can... Watch that on our YouTube channel, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. Of course, you can always catch my radio program on the Beatles called Every Little Thing. And the easiest way to do that is to listen to it on demand at WFDU's website, WFDU.FM. Go to their archival page and they have two shows that are always there, which uh, stay on the website for two weeks. It's a one hour show, covers Beatles, solo, rarities, thematic sets, interviews, you name it, right there on WFDU.FM. And don't forget Beatles Trivia on my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. You can win lots of great prizes, including the McCartney Legacy book, of which we have one of the co-authors in his own home right now, smiling and waving. Go on, wave. <laughs> <laughs> That is a, by the way, that is a great episode. Episode, that is a great edition of Record Collector. Um, I used to read Record Collector going back uh, in the nineties, and always, even though it was it was UK centric um, with the releases, uh, I found it very informative of other bands that I was getting into and was already into. Mm -hmm. I haven't picked up a copy in a while, so it was nice to. Uh, to see that they did the McCartney issue. I think I, I think I was at a, at a Mets game when I saw that the magazine was out and thought, let me order it now um, on my phone. So I'm trying to place an order for a UK magazine at the Mets. They were probably losing the Mets, so it's not like I was missing something. Uh, but uh, it is a wonderful, ep uh, wonderful episode. It's a wonderful edition. Um, so uh, are you done? Yes, that's it. Oh, okay. Alan, how about you? Um, well, you know, I'm still uh, beginning the research for volume three. Um, Adrian does really the heavy lifting in terms of the research, but since I have all the Rolling Stones and Beatle fans and other things here, I thought I'd get a hit start. Um, I also wanted to say, you know, before, you know, before just, you know, giving the technical stuff, uh, a couple of other things about Michael Lindsay Hogg. Um, if you haven't read his autobiography, which is called Luck and Circumstance, it's really, really interesting, really a good read. Um, everybody watching this undoubtedly knows he did the paperback writer in rain videos. He did, well, we spoke about that in the Hey Jude and Revolution ones uh, leading up to Let It Be and the Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus. Um, but there's so much other stuff he's done. And uh, I, I just want to mention one thing that he only partly did because I think he had 
ca got called away to do something else uh, during the production of it. But um, it's a, a, a BBC film uh, series, really, of Evelyn Waugh's Brideshead Revisited. And it's just exquisite. Um, but also for people watching this particular podcast, it has one other Beatles connection, which is that Jane Asher is in it. Um, mm. I'm not sure whether Michael directed the episodes that had Jane in it. Um, if we had more time with him, we could have got to that maybe. But uh, also, you know, we interviewed him, as I mentioned, uh, for McCartney Legacy. Uh, he's in volume one a bit, talking, for instance, about that uh, idea of Paul's turning bits of Let It Be upside down. Um, but he comes back in volume two um, for quite a lot of stuff because he did the video of Mullen Kintyre, Mull of, Mull of Kintyre. Um, he did uh, With a Little Luck in London Town, and he worked on Wings Over the World. Uh, didn't stay to finish it. He had some Rolling Stones videos to direct and uh, sort of left the project before it was finished. But, you know, he had he had a lot of ideas that went into that film and was involved in the early editing of it. So, um, yeah. I would love to have asked him about the uh, soap bubble video of it's only rock and roll, but I like it. With Rolling stones. Yeah. Yeah. Filling the, filling the, uh, the studio with soap bubbles. Yeah. I mean, and you know, look on Wikipedia. I mean, his list of films. This is just the films. It's pretty uh, impressive. So he also um, directed the the TV movie of uh, Two of Us, right? Yeah, right. With uh, Aidan Quinn as Paul McCartney, and it's really a very good movie. I think Paul was impressed by it. I think he was very moved by it, from what I remember reading. Yeah. So um, you can get in touch with me on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Uh, you can write to all three of us here at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. Um, you can feel free to comment on the YouTube videos or I'm, I'm, I think Podbean has a comment section too. Uh and Podbean sends the audio version all over the place to Apple and iHeartRadio and uh, and you name it. So you can get the audio version of this, uh, lots of places, the video version on YouTube. And um, you can follow us on Twitter at, at Things We Said Fab and check out our Facebook page, Things We Said Today video podcast. Uh, did I have anything else? I don't think so. That's it. That's it. All right. Well, thank you, Alan. And uh, uh, another another very special show. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Things We Said Today. And we will be back uh, in a couple of weeks uh, with a sh another show. And uh, for those of you, uh, you know, we don't see you before that, enjoy Crooked Boy again. And for Ken Michaels and for Alan Cozen, I'm Darren. Oh, I didn't tell you about me. No. Oh, very quickly. Uh, WFUV. If you want to listen to me on WFUV, uh, Monday through Thursday night um, from uh, 10 p.m. till 2 a.m., four nights a week, late night. Uh, and then Saturday, you get to listen from 1 to 4. That's when I'm on the air uh, at WFUV, which is 90.7 FM uh, in the New York City metropolitan area. Or listen anywhere you are by streaming WFUV at WFUV. Dot org or get our app and, and very quickly i made uh what was a pretty much a, a spur of the moment guest appearance on two legs the podcast two legs this past sunday uh, and talking about uh the massive uber mind games box set with tom hunyadi um with andy nichols and another special guest uh joe mayo so that was a fun conversation that kind of went all over the place and uh, I think we ended up talking about uh, food and stuff by the end. But uh, no. Uh, so that's something you could check out uh, the Two Legs podcast with your host, Tom Hunyadi and Andy Nichols. So now we say goodbye. 
for uh, Ken Michaels and for Alan Cozen. I'm Darren DeVivo. Thank you so much for putting up your finger and telling me to stop talking. Just wanted to say a big thank you from all of us to Michael Lindsay Hogg and to Jennifer Ballantyne yes. for helping to arrange this. The lovely Jennifer Ballantyne really made this happen. And I want to thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer, for making this happen. I will proceed now and say for Alan Cozen and for Ken Michaels, no fingers? No. Uh, thank you so much for watching the show. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and we will get together soon. Take care.